What is up, my crew? This is the Nook Podcast. My name is Steven, and it is so good to have you listening. If I may ask a quick favor, when you are done listening to today's episode, could you pop over to Apple Podcasts and leave a good review? It really does help get the word out about this podcast, and I would very much appreciate it. My guest today is author and speaker Tabitha Kaplinger. I reached out to her to talk about her writing process and to get her take on the power of storytelling. I firmly believe that we all have stories to tell, and maybe you just need a little bit of encouragement to tell more of yours, even when they are a little rough around the edges or unfinished. No matter where you are in your faith journey, you can encourage someone with your story. So settle in for my conversation with Tabitha Kaplinger. I just want to kind of get your take to dive into this. Why is story so important to you? It's actually kind of one of those God moments in my life. I have always had a vivid imagination. So I feel like as a kid, I always had some sort of story going on in my head that I was a part of. And I love stories in the form of TV and movies. I'm a huge TV and movie addict. (laughs) <laughs> just because of story and you Same. connect with yeah, you connect with people through shared love of a story or a fandom. I think that then I, I always felt like I wanted to write and it's this weird story of God just being a great redeemer because I never, even though I've always liked stories, I never thought about writing stories. Mm. I never really thought about being a writer. And then I found myself after a whole series of events at, um, a liberal arts college for women, Sweetbriar College in Virginia, which I love that school. I love that campus. It, I'm so grateful for the two semesters I was there, but I showed up like a semester late. So I'm the kid that's there after everybody else kind of has been there for a <laughs> semester. Because again, my plans, God shifted them around and I ended up there and I go in and I meet with um, my the dean of admissions and they're like, well, what are you going to major in? I don't know. I, and I thought about, well, I'll do photojournalism. I'll do communications, but they didn't have a communications major and the Mm. photography classes were full because I'm a semester late. So the next best thing was creative writing. Mm. And I dove into it. I was there for two semesters, took so many writing classes, I also took a fencing class, which is only important because I write books about people with swords. So I, <laughs> I that counts. Still important but then. It's so, it was so fun. <laughs> and I left there and started pursuing ministry. And for a really long time, I felt God had called me to write, that mm. writing was going to be a part of my ministry. And for about 10 years, I really struggled with writing Because somewhere in my mind was this idea that pastors write nonfiction. Right. Pastors write devotional books. Pastors write those kind of books. And I tried and just didn't enjoy it, but I enjoyed writing. And I I still felt called to write, but not that. Mm. (laughs) And I got this idea for a story kind of just popped into my mind. I started asking questions that led to what became my first three books. And even in writing those, I was probably halfway through the first book, really enjoying it, really passionate about it, but still struggling with the idea of writing stories. And I would pray, you know, God, am I supposed to do this? Like pastors aren't supposed to write stories about girls with swords and slaying (laughs) demons and sassiness and, I was sitting in a women's conference, listening to Christine Kane preach and very much heard the voice of God go, who told you that? Mm. And it was like one of those moments where I very clearly know it was the Holy Spirit going, who told you that? Who told you that that's what pastors write? Who told you that that's what you have to write? And from that moment on, I never questioned the idea of writing a story. People ask me all the time, being a pastor, am I going to write a devotional? Am I going to write non? fiction. And usually my answer is no. Hmm. 
Like I, I teach teenagers, I lead small groups, I preach. I, I, th- when I write, I want to write stories. And I have just come through writing those stories, come to the conclusion that stories can connect with people in a way that a sermon just can't. Yeah. It's a different level. And I think especially for people who don't yet know Jesus, they will pick up a story Yeah, and they will let their guard down for a story and the humanity in a story. We connect with other characters, even characters in fantastical settings, because I tend to write fantasy. We connect with characters in a world that we cannot imagine and we can't fathom because we connect with the same emotions. We feel the same Mm -hmm. things. We have the same struggles. And with that, like I said, we let our guard down. And so when we do that, when you can weave the truth of God's word into a story in a way that I think is authentic and genuine and not with the intent to bash someone over the head Mm. with a message. Cause that for me, I never go in going, here's the message. Now let me figure out a story. Right. I go, here's the story and any message, any theme, any bits of biblical truth that are tied to it are simply because I love Jesus and follow Jesus. And so he's an organic central part of my life and my thinking. And I think that when that's woven in authentically, like I said, people let their guard down and and connect with a story and it can do something into, in the deeper parts of us that other medium just can't. And I think it's solely because of letting our guard down. Even as Christ followers, sometimes we go into church on Sunday or we go into a sermon with a preconceived notion Mm -hmm. or with our guard up and we're a little bit defensive, not necessarily meaning to be, but with the story, I, I, I don't think that's what happens as much. And I've come more and more to go. Jesus told stories. That's why he told parables. It was his gig. (laughs) Yeah. Parables connected with people right where they were in a language they understood with emotions they understood. And he used them to speak truth. And the Bible is so full of story. I love eat this book by Eugene Peterson, which talks about the art of sacred reading, reading God's word. Mm. It's like, it's a story. It's God's story. It's, and it's full of stories and narrative. And so for me, I just more and more, I'm like, I dig this storyteller (laughs) gig. And I feel like Jesus, it's been really cool to see how Jesus has used those stories and people have picked up on, on the bits of truth and hope and faith uh, that maybe would have been turned off by a sermon sure, or wouldn't have ever listened to a sermon. Right. Well, and I think what, what it sounds like you're saying is that when, when you're kind of when you're so rooted in Jesus, it's just gonna come out. Not that sure. it's it's not something that you have to try to manufacture. Or like you said, it was like, well, here's a story. Let me try to figure out how to put Jesus in here. It's like, no, yeah. it's it's coming from who you are. It's it's seeping from you. <laughs> you yeah, know, like like when like, you eat too much garlic. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just there. You're gonna sweat it out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I can only imagine then that. How how does that hit your readers? I mean, you you've got to get feedback. What what do people say about reading some of your work? For sure, and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. I think anything we do creatively, those reviews come in, right? Oh, sure, Movie, sure. TV, books, and some people love it and some people don't. I've had some people that as much as I try and be organic and that my stories are not overt and preachy, they're just Mm. a story that Jesus finds his way into. There are some people who find are always going to find it too preachy. Some people don't find it preachy enough. Yep. (laughs) Um, But for the most part, I feel like the feedback from readers has been really cool as they've connected with a certain character. I've had Mm -hmm. readers who don't believe in God, who struggle with faith, who would even call themselves an atheist, go, I connected with Lucas, who's Mm -hmm. a character in my urban fantasy trilogy, who struggles with belief and who starts out not believing. And they'll, and really they'll just go, and I have questions. 
And so it opens this conversation to faith and to Jesus. My latest book, The Wolf Queen, which released in January, it was so cool to see so many people read that book. And that book met a bunch of new readers through, mm. I think, again, just Jesus doing what Jesus does with his timing and his connections <laughs> that I did not know, didn't have a relationship with several of them not being Christian deaf, or if they are, they are not from the same Christian background as I am. And so I'm always a little bit kind of like, okay, how are people going to receive some of this? And so many people were just like, it was so good for my heart. Mm. Starting out 2021, this is what my heart needed. And it gave me hope. And that even if they're not fully recognizing, well, that's Jesus. I feel like that says you did your job well, because that is Jesus. Right. He, the hope, that thing that makes your heart feel good. And that brought you a little bit of peace and light. Wasn't me. Mm. It was him and his hope and his truth woven in there. So those are really cool moments. Those are my favorite moments. And like I said, not everybody always likes the story or likes the message that ends up coming out of it or the characters or whatever, because art can be so super subjective. Oh, yeah. But when someone is just encouraged or challenged, and I love when readers send me those emails or I see those reviews and it's someone going, man, this really just encouraged me to get close to God again. Sure. I sit back and go, well, it was just a story about a girl slaying demons. You know, there's it, it, that's, but God does what he does yes. with anything that we use our gifts for. He does what he does. And so it's been really cool to see people see Jesus, even if they don't maybe readily recognize some people do, some people don't that mm. that's what it is, but right. that he is offering some sort of hope and encouragement through the story that I'm telling. Well, then would you say that, is it, is it your objective? You sit down to start writing a book or you're midway writing a book. Is your objective to ultimately point to Jesus or is it, this is a fantasy book that you want people to get kind of lost in uh, is there a way for you to kind of explain you know is there a a list of things it's like well number one I hope they get this number two I hope they get this How, what is that I, process like I I don't think I ever sit down and think that hard about it hmm. for me I want everything in my life to ultimately point to Jesus hmm. sometimes I'm really good at it sometimes I fail at it so I think there's always a part of me that wants whatever story I'm writing to point someone to Jesus in some way, shape, or form. But I don't ever sit down and go, this is the way I want that to happen. Hmm. I just have an idea for a story. And usually my ideas start out with something really small, one image, one line, one character that develops after a lot of questions. And none of those questions are, what is the big spiritual theme or mm. message? What's going to be the part of this story that points someone to Jesus? It's just, this is a story. And as I put myself on the page, what I believe is <clears throat> organically going to come out of that. So mm. it's kind of a, a yes and no that yes, because I want everything I do to point people to the person of Jesus and the hope and love that are found in him. I don't, I'm not super intentional about that piece. When I write the story, I just let that kind of happen. Okay. And I see it happen as I write, I see those bits of biblical truth come out. I see my worldview right. come out. I see those things come coming out of it. So I'm not unaware of them, but I, I don't plot them or plan them into the story. Gotcha. Okay. Well, um, were there other authors in your space that inspired you, um, that helped you build upon where you are now in your writing? Um, what was that? Was there an initial, you know, inspiration or, or someone that does what you do? I think 
Hmm. There are definitely some authors that I love and I love what they did. And so in that way, they probably inspired me to one really big one with this idea that you can live in both worlds of ministry Mm. and pastoring and, and preaching. And at the same time, telling story with CS Lewis, not because he was a pastor, but he, he did both. Right. You know, you have mere Christianity and you have Narnia. Yep. You ha- and so and he was masterful in both. <laughs> yes. And and even, you know, everybody knows Narnia, but even until we have faces and out of the silent plant, all of those there, he was really good at weaving truth. Right. Um, and I think he was probably more intentional with some of the biblical imagery especially in Narnia, you know, (laughs) Oh, very much so (laughs) very much intentionality in that more so than me, but just that living in both worlds, that really probably was the biggest inspiration for me that I can do this, that I can tell stories and Mm. that those stories can point people to Jesus in the probably, I feel like probably a lot of ways better than a sermon can. And then in, just in my life now, I have a community of other authors who are also Christ followers who tell stories and are fantastic storytellers mm. who I also see their lives online and on social media and in person and how they point people to Jesus with their lives. Right. And that does show up in their stories in the same way. And they're an encouragement on a more and an inspiration on a more personal level because they are some people that I would call friends. Mm. And so they're the people that we bounce things off of one another and we encourage each other on a bad day or when, you know, when we're struggling with the whole writing gig. And so in that way, they're kind of an inspiration that, and just kind of, we're like this little group that just keeps each other going. And it's cool because when I first started, you feel like, well, I'm the only person Mm -hmm. who is pastoring and right. I'm the only person who's doing this. And then God has a way of going, no, you're not the only one. Yep. There are people and and maybe they're not staff pastors vocationally at a church, but they very much are living for Jesus and writing stories. Gotcha. So you're not alone in this. Right. Well, and I know you speak a lot. You're, you're, you and your husband are youth pastors, and you, you just told me you've been doing that for 20 years, which, again, kudos to you. Uh, so you're speaking to young people on a regular basis. Um, do you use story with that as much? I mean, are you, again, I, I realize that standing in front of a group of people is entirely different than sitting in front of a laptop hammering out story, but because you know story works so well in drawing people in, um, can you talk about how that kind of bridges back to conveying truths to a 15-year-old? Yeah, I I don't obviously approach a sermon the same way as a book, but there's always an element of story, Mm. especially with teenagers, because one of the best ways to communicate with teenagers is to tell your story yeah to make it personal to give an a real life example and for that to be conveyed effectively is storytelling how am Mm -hmm. i going to tell my story or even someone else's story as we find illustrations and examples in a way that they're going to understand Mm -hmm. even just communicating a bible story Mm -hmm. Can I tell this story of David, this story of Moses, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a way that is engaging to these students? And teenagers, I feel like teenagers get a bad rap a lot of the time because people are always like, oh, you work with teenagers. Like, wow, I could never do that. (laughs) And in some ways, teenagers can be, but I think it's because teenagers really strive for authenticity. Um the biggest problem with like teenagers don't like hypocrites, right? Teenagers want that authenticity and they want to be engaged. And so it's, I've got to communicate this story from God's word in a way that feels real and that hits them where they are 
So in that regard, it probably is a lot more like storytelling than I give it credit for when I sit down to write a, a sermon because they're both communicating truth. How can I communicate truth? How can I communicate this idea? How can I give them what I want to give them in a way that they can receive it and it is impactful to them? So mm -hmm. basically, whether through story or sermon, how am I connecting to the reader, to the listener in a way that is impactful. Yeah. Well, and I think you you definitely hit it right on the head. If if anybody can sniff out a phony, it's a 15-year-old. They Oh, for sure. They From want, a mile away. Yeah. They want to know that you're not just phoning it in, that that what you're saying is legit and that you can back it up, I think. Oh yeah. Um well, so then how do we because I, I, I will I'm gonna venture so far as to put myself in your camp as a storyteller. How do we then encourage other people to embrace their own story? Because I think, you know, testimony is maybe an older church yeah. kind of word, but that's still what it comes down to. Story equals your testimony. But I think if more people at whatever stage of their faith that they are in, could find some boldness to share their story, that they would find themselves engaging with people in completely different ways, especially about faith matters. For sure. Most people, I feel, struggle to tell their story because they don't think their story has value. Yes. Agreed. Sometimes we're, maybe it's because it's our story and we're so close to it and we know all the good, bad, and ugly of it. Sometimes it's because we look at some people and their testimony, their story of coming to Jesus and finding freedom, and ours seems to pale in comparison. Yes. We didn't have this huge earth-shattering experience. It was quieter moments of faithfulness. And so we feel one sort of story has value and one doesn't. Mm. My husband always says that there are two great stories, the gospel and your story of how Jesus impacted oh, you. Oh, that's good. That's really and so good. So however Jesus impacted you, whatever Jesus has done for you, whatever that has looked like is a great story. Yes. And it's a story worth sharing because the other part that he always says is people can argue a whole lot of things, but they cannot argue your experience. Yeah. So when I share my experience with people, genuinely, authentically, trying to connect emotionally. It doesn't have to be practiced and rehearsed and perfect. It can be messy and raw and real. It will connect with people on some level, even mm -hmm. if their life has been different than mine, because we all connect on some level. We all have some sort of shared emotion mm -hmm. that we can understand another person, even if their life has been totally different than ours. Sure. So I feel like for most people, it's mainly helping them to understand that their story matters. My husband and I have very opposite testimonies of how <laughs> we grew up and came to know Jesus and were called into ministry. And we tell people all the time, neither one of those is more impactful than the other. Mm. Our audience might be different a little bit because my story is going to impact a certain person and his story is going to impact a certain person, but that's the same with any book or movie. Mm -hmm. And it's, and we don't know the impact we're going to have until we tell the story. Right. But the enemy would like nothing more than for us to sit back and go, my story doesn't matter and keep us quiet or make us feel like we aren't good enough to tell our story. I don't have the right words. And it's one of the things I loved about talking about Moses and the burning bush at our church and that storytellers is Moses is that guy going, God, I can't do this. I don't yeah. have the words. I don't know what to say. I stutter. And God's response is who made your mouth? Yeah. Like I made you, I'm, I can give you the words. I can help you tell your story. Right. The way it needs to be told, understand that your story matters. I feel like a lot of us, and we still all have to work through certain aspects of confidence and getting to that bold place. But I feel like the first hurdle is really truly believing that 
how Jesus has impacted me right. will matter to someone else. Well, and especially it's, it's something that after working in churches myself, uh, all too often you, you see a testimony video. It's always, you're getting a quick story arc of, you know, I once was blind, but now I see kind of a thing. And it always seems to be so tied up with a bow at the end. And those are, yeah. those are good. I mean, I, I want to know those stories. I want to see those triumphs. But I think in truth that most of us are in a place of, of a half-written story. And I think that kind of to your point there, that even those half-written, halfway done stories still have a value, if only to go back to what you said about how, as a, as a fledgling author, you felt alone, like you were the only yeah. one. Even a half-told story can encourage somebody to just go, oh, that's me too. What are you doing? And how, you know, now, now you and I can lock arms over something that Most even definitely. something still in the matrix can be of value. Most definitely. It's one of the things I love. My very first book is The Chronicle of the Three Bloodline, and it's the first in a trilogy. And one of the reviews I got struggled with it because that character of Lucas, the way it ends, his story, is not tied up in a neat little bow hmm. of he found the Lord and saw the light and his whole life changed right. in a moment. It actually is left in that part one very upended. Yeah. and unsettled as to what he's going to do. And, and my response was, but that's life. Yes. Like sometimes we have this encounter with Jesus and we don't really know exactly what to do with it or how to walk it out. And it, or it's going to take a process. It's going to take a journey of letting go of all all of the things that we've been tied to for so long. Yes. Sometimes that freedom is a process. It's it's one of the things I ended up really loving about that character. And even several of the characters in that story is it was messy. Their yeah. walk with God was messy, but our walk with God is messy. That it's <laughs> not perfect. We still mess up. We still struggle. We still doubt. And that's okay. It's okay in a fiction story and it's okay in real life to say, I have not yet arrived. I don't have it all together. I still mess up. I still doubt, but Jesus. Yeah, exactly. And the, the reason that you got a chuckle out of me there was that the, the tagline for my podcast is real faith in real time. And what I've always said with that is that real faith is messy. It's never symmetrical. Um, and real time means that even something I what sounds like an overnight success probably took a whole long time. And for that matter, even I, I finished this story, but it's still not done. I can tell you that things are better now, but I'm still a work in progress. And that just because I if I weigh 10 pounds lighter today as a weight loss story, I'm not done because it's going to take work to keep the 10 pounds Most off. definitely. Most definitely. And some of that is what makes a good story in fiction is the mess. Mm. Yeah, we want a happy ending. I'm a sucker for a happy ending. And I love a good happy ending in a fictional story, in a movie. I like that closure. I like that. But even to have those pieces that are still messy, because I think sometimes we do a disservice when everything is always tied in a neat little bow for people. When everything is packaged in its most polished form, as far as Christianity and our stories go, because one, that's not what real Christianity looks like. Nope. And so we make people feel like it's all unicorns and rainbows and lollipops. And I love lollipops, but it's, it's not there's struggle and there's doubt and there's constantly working it out that theological word sanctification mm -hmm. because we're human and we're flawed. And so it, it's not overnight, but we like that in our world. And so that's what we sell to people, yes. but it's, it's only half truth. Right. God is good. And he brings peace and hope and joy and so many good things, but it is not neat and clean and tidy. Right. It, 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 it's very messy a lot of the time. Well, and truthfully, what a disservice we do to a watching world. And I would even to God when we try to package it as so perfect and, you know, cut 90 degree squares. It's 
it's messy and it will likely stay messy. But I guess if nothing else, I'm learning to embrace that messiness because that's where I'm relating to people the most. That's where you're going to have your broader appeal as opposed to putting, all right, this is the standard. It's way up here. And if you don't have it, nah, sucks to be you. No. Yeah. It's no. We're, we're, we're all messes. How do we help each other with our messes? And, and that's why our stories are important, our individual stories, because people can relate to the mess. We don't have to be perfect and polished and prepackaged in this neat little box because people can't relate to the box and we sell them the box. And then when their life doesn't match up to the neat, tidy bow on top, they either feel like they are doing something wrong and failing mm -hmm. as a Christian, which isn't to say maybe that they're just imperfect. You know, they're yeah. just not there yet. They're learning like all of us had to learn or we make them feel like Christianity was a lie because you sold me this neat little bow on top yeah. product. Everything was supposed to be perfect now. And that's not what I'm experiencing. And so this isn't truth. And that's, it's, it's part of why I love stories. It's why I love people's stories. And my husband is so good at connecting with people. I'm the introverted, not people one. <laughs> He's the <laughs> extroverted people one. But both of us have really learned that the students we connect to most and have the most impact with, the, the people in our lives that we can come alongside and really coach and lead are the people that we are genuine with and can be vulnerable and messy with that they mm. see our messy, they see our imperfection. And because then they feel like they can be honest about theirs. Right. And it's, that's a real true safe place for people is they understand, Hey, I'm kind of a mess, but you are too. And if you're less of a mess, it's only because you've gone through some of the steps, some of the pieces, some of the process that I haven't yet gone through. Right. And we're always being refined. We're always being refined. Yeah. And well, and the truth is Jesus didn't promise to clean up all of our messes. He promised to walk <laughs> through us or walk us through them and give us For the sure. peace when everything else seems to be that messy. Yeah. Back in the early 2000s, there was a Christian animated series called Angel Wars. And I love it. My husband and I love it. We bought the DVDs. We actually just looked them up the other day because somehow we lost them in one of our moves and we were looking them up and we we're like, man, we forgot, like, this was good. This was pretty good, decent Christian media <laughs> for the time, this animated series. And one of the lines, one of the characters, um, they were talking about two of these young, like rookie angels. It's a whole backstory. Everyone look up angel wars, but they <laughs> they were like, you know, you're throwing them out in the fire. They're not ready. And his response was the maker chooses to refine by fire. Mm. And that again is a process and it's a messy one and it hurts. And sometimes things have to go through the fire several times. And in talking this last week at church about Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, my husband even mentioned, he said, God did not keep them from the fire and he didn't pull them out of the fire. Right. Because that was part of the process. And he used that experience to impact that king, to impact the people around them. Our messiness, our imperfections show off Jesus and his perfection yes. better than anything else. Admitting, hey, I don't have it together and anything in me that looks like it's all together and looks good is solely because of Jesus, 100%. And if he can do it in my life, he can most certainly do it in yours. I'd like to repeat something that Tabitha shared. There are two great stories, the gospel and the story of how it impacted you. Your story matters. And I'm praying that you find your voice to tell it. You never know who might be impacted by all the things that you have been through. In the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 12, Paul wrote, When we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith but I also want to be encouraged by yours. I believe that something special happens when we have the courage to share our stories with each other. 
I've got links in the show notes if you'd like more information on Tabitha and her books. If you're a fan of urban fantasy, I think you will enjoy her writing. While you're in the show notes, I've got a link to the Nook Facebook page, as well as links to my social media feeds if you'd like to follow along. And I'm always available by email. The address is stephen at nookpodcast.com. That's stephen with a V at nookpodcast.com. Thank you so much for listening today, and I will catch you here next time in the Nook. The Nook Podcast is a production of Sozo Digital Media.